Well, 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 welcome. welcome. <laughs> How are you? We are fine. Please go by inside the garden. Very good. Ve very good, very good. I need to talk to Grandpa. Okay. Now, you know something? If, if I wanted to be an astronaut, right? Yeah. And anybody asks me, who do you want to be like? I'll say, oh, I want to be like Neil Armstrong. Okay. If I wanted to be maybe a race car driver, and he asks me, who do I want to be like? I'll say, I'll oh, be like Schum Michael Schumacher. It's the same way if you want to be a uh, basketball player. Yeah, you say who? Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan. That's it. And then, like so then you want to be like Einstein, right? I want to be like a musician. So you are like Michael Jackson or something like that, right? Yes. See, so exactly. So I want to be like the best interviewer on TV. So you know who I want to be like? I want to be like your granddad. He's the thespian when it comes to TV perfection, excellence, and that's why I'm here to find out why everybody in TV today wants to be like your grandfather, Michael Egan. When we come back from the break, we're meeting their grandfather, Mike Egan. Stay tuned. Well, hello and welcome back. And you can tell from my obvious excitement. As well as, I mean, there's a lot of history being here. I mean many 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 years ago I was in Northridge Lyceum right and anytime we break we need to run outside not because our parents are going to get us but we're just waiting for this red sports car to pull up because Mike Egan was coming to pick his kids up and you didn't want to miss him because you know, he just stands up picks his kids up and go and for us it's fantastic again once in a week the show comes on and the intro is like well 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 welcome well, 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 welcome to the show. And somewhere in the intro, this red postcard pulls up again. The light pops up and pops in. And never in my days did I think that I'd be sat here about to interview the guy who drove the sports car. That's all I know about him. Even though I know he's a thespian and a mass and a wealth of information. Anyone worth his sort in the media today, anyone worth his sort, will tell you, I want to be like Mike Egan. I'm here to find out why. Uncle Mike, <laughs> I am privileged. <laughs> I don't know whether you are privileged or I am privileged. As you said, when I was on radio, I crowned myself the Magnificent Emperor. But I'm humbled to be talking to a chief. <laughs> True and crowned Nana. It's my privilege. Thank you very much, but as an able war, he did not open it, so still I have. Mike, now, I have come into this interview, normally I'd read and read and read and read about you, but I've come into this interview with all I know about you, picking your kids up from school and watching your intro to your program when I was young. And that's what I've come into this interview with. Everything I'm going to find out, I'll literally find out from here. But you come across like you came from a very data background, like a very privileged background. Not really, not really. We were nine in number in the mm -hmm. family. I was the fifth born. Okay. And uh, I wouldn't say I'm a data ah. My father <laughs> didn't treat any one of us as data But well, my eldest brother, who unfortunately passed away some eight years ago, mm -hmm. was a data I see. <laughs> Before we talk about me, let, let me talk about him. Yeah. Because he was the firstborn, my father really pampered him. And at the tender age of four or five, going to school, those days, I'm talking about maybe early 60, 70 years ago, mm -hmm. he would go to school in a shoe and a white socks. But he would be carried on the shoulder because my father didn't have a car then. He'd be carried on the shoulder <laughs> to school. And after school, he'd be picked again and carried on the shoulder back home. He was Dadaba. No, that, I wasn't that. No, that, that's that. <laughs> <laughs> now that's Dadaba. <laughs> My father was a civil servant. Okay. Uh, very modest living. In those days, it was, what shall I say, a privilege to be a civil servant working for the colonial masters. Mm -hmm. uh, but he made sure we all went to school, except for my other sister, who my father, for whatever reason, didn't want her to go to school. Uh, but we all went to school okay. and uh, we did our best. So was it growing up in Accra or growing up outside? No, we were born, well, that's another story. My father comes from Enyandinchra in the central region. Mm -hmm. My mother is from Anamabo, but I am from Sekendi. Because you were born in Sekendi? Born, bred and baked. 
<laughs> <laughs> and maybe sold to Accra. You see, I, came, I, schooled, I went to school all my years in secondary Takarari. Mm -hmm. I came to Accra in 1961 to broadcasting. Wow. So, preparatory school, nursery, secondary school? I didn't go to nursery. My father himself was a teacher before he joined the civil service. Okay. And he, he had this formula of teaching his children the, the, the rudiments of studying until a certain age that he would send you to school. Wow. So I went to school maybe at the age of nine because at my, during my time, my period, he didn't have time to teach me in the house. And every day he postponed it until he found the time. So by the time I was going to elementary school, class one, I was already nine years old. In those days that you have to put your hand here yeah. and touch your ear and then you are admitted in class. Okay. Luckily, because of the teaching and the training he gave me in the house, I spent my one first day, class one, I was sent to class two. Because when he gave me the mathematics, arithmetic we call it then, I went through it like a fire. One, two, three. In English, I was quick. So I was sent to the class two. Class two, I was there for two weeks, class three. Wow. So I caught up in standard one. I see. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was a good teacher then. Yeah, well, he, he did. Yeah, of he course. Did, yeah. How about mom? My mom, unfortunately, was illiterate. Okay. Uh, but she was a very loving mother. Mm. And she did everything to support my father, to give us the best sort of uh, upbringing. Uh, I never heard my mom and my dad quarrel. What I noticed when I grew up was that when one gets angry, the other one doesn't even talk. <laughs> Until they have found a way, maybe over the night, they're able to resolve it and come out. It was a very happy family. Yeah. My father would, would share a lot of things, but he was a strict disciplinarian. Another thing that helped us in upbringing was that my father was a member of the first century gospel. Well, the, 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 uh, people call them chilbentia. They don't believe in medication when you are ill. Oh. You pray to God who has all the powers and all the medical knowledge to, mm -hmm. to, to heal you. So. This sort of upbringing and the discipline helped us to be what we are today. So after secondary school, Accra or? I went to secondary school in Sekendi, mm -hmm. Fijai Secondary School. Okay. And we were the second batch of the pioneers. Ah. Uh, Nkrumah wanted to establish secondary schools in all the regions. Mm -hmm. And so he started one in, in secondary, which was known as the Fijai Secondary School. Originally, it was the secondary school. And we started at the old hospital near Isikado. It was an old hospital that he took over and converted into a school. But later on, we got a piece of land and we moved to Fijai, where the school is now. Yeah. So I went to Fijai Secondary School, and some of my mates were General Eskin, uh, Kanel Kome, uh, Techi, Douna, and a few others that I don't remember readily. Great man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a great man. So at what point did you come to Accra? Well, my visit to Accra was interesting and exciting. Mm. There was a group, there was a program on GBC mm -hmm. called the Guitar Club. Guitarists, two, three guitarists with the rhythm sections, no wind instruments. And there was another one in Kumasi. Kumasi Guitar Club. But I thought at that time, and I had listened to the programs, mm -hmm. and I liked it. I liked jazz music. And I thought that Tekendi Tekradu could get the best of the, two, of the three. Because we had the two best guitarists in Ghana then. One was called Bebop Agri, and the other was Tricky Johnson. Mm -hmm. We also had Ray Ellis. I don't know if you've ever heard about him. He was no. a pianist who used to be with the GBC band. Uh, Tom Tom Ado, who used to be with the Tempos band, was playing for the Broadway band. So I tried and got these guys together that, look, guys, you guys are very good, and I'm sure we can play better than the ones in Accra and Kumasi. So they agreed. And I spent my own income to hire instruments, hire a place for them, and give them money for transportation to come rehearsals. Then I contacted Mr. Leo Rabbi Williams, who was then head of entertainment in GBC, mm -hmm. if you'll be interested in recording the Tuck Rally Guitar Club. Luckily, he accepted the invitation and came to record them, and it was a blast. Wow. Indeed, it was the best. 
But why I came to Accra was that Leo had come to Tech Radio to record Radio Dance Time, one of the most popular programs on radio then. Mm -hmm. Live band music, live audience, singing, dancing to the music. Fortunately for me, the MC that he would normally use, Mr. David O'Hara, was out of town. So he needed somebody to step in for him. And he asked me if I would be interested in emceeing for the program. I jumped to it. So he, and I went to the beach and did my own rehearsal. I, knew, I had an idea what to do, but I needed to polish it up. Mm -hmm. And we were living close to the beach, so I went to the beach and I was screaming and yelling, practicing what I would say and how I would do the it. man coming on stage. Yeah, and this, yeah. And I, was, I must run. prove to Leo that he's picked the right guy. <laughs> so we did the program, and luckily it was recorded, broadcast, and I had myself on radio, something that I've cherished. A week later, I had a call. Really, Abu Williams. Mr. Egan, would you like to come and work for broadcasting? I said, yes. When can I come? He said, any time you're ready. So I arranged with my mother that, look, this is what has happened. I have to go to Accra. Don't tell the old man. But give me a couple of days to work it out. So my mother, mothers are always like that. She supported me. So I jumped on the bus, came to Accra, went to see Mr. Leo Abu Williams at broadcasting house. And my first day, he gave me a stopwatch, took me to Bubuashi. There's a radio dancer, I'm going to record it. I knew, I've never seen a stopwatch. <laughs> I didn't know how to use it. But he gave me that, that job. To go on. Luckily, Mr. Sammy London, who was a seasoned MC, mm -hmm. was asked to come and lead the show. So we recorded, and that was also broadcast. So my first trip to Accra was going to do radio dance time. Then when my father finally found out about three, four days that I was in Accra, he asked my uncle to come and pick me by the hand back to Takradi. Well, My father wanted me to be a banker. So uh, soon after secondary school, he took me to Buckley's Bank, DCO, High Street, Takradi, and got the manager because of his status. And I, I got employed there. Took me back to the manager and said, look, I'm sorry my son has misbehaved, blah, 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 blah. He's back I would work. like you to take him back. But whilst I was at the bank, during breaks, I was always entertaining the staff, singing, cracking jokes and all that. So the bank manager said, I think your son will be good for broadcasting. But Mr. Egan, I tell you what, I'll give you six months, let him go. If it doesn't work out, he comes back, I'll take him. My father is the type of person who can say no to a white man, <laughs> colonial master. Yeah. He's the type of person that if the telephone in the house rings and he's sitting down, you can tell he's talking to another African. But if he stands up, one hand behind him, and all he says is, yes, sir, sir, I'll do, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, sir, sir. And if you dare make noise, you are in trouble. So my father agreed to the suggestion <laughs> by, from my bank manager, Mr. Every, and he allowed me to come to Accra. That's how I got to, to broadcasting in 1961. Wow. So back to GBC. No, I wasn't with GBC then. Okay. I was, I was from the bank. My first trip to Accra was to join GBC. Yeah. So you want us to go back to GBC? No, no, no. I mean, after you went back to yeah, the, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. you are right. Yeah, after right. you went to, uh, to Accra the bank and then you came back, back, went back to GBC. GBC. They took you back. They, they took me back. Okay. But at that time, I wasn't even employed on the staff payroll. Okay. I was a guest artist. So one earned one's income through what one did. Uh, you compile a record program for 30 minutes, you get, I think, two guineas or one guinea. You go and do radio dance time, you get five guineas for presenting radio dance time and other programs. That's how we end up, until I was then employed. By. The reason why I didn't get immediately employed was that my salary scale didn't fit into the GBC salary scale. At the bank, I think I was being paid 16 pounds a month. GBC was about eight pounds or so a month. Not mm -hmm. enough, so mm -hmm. I had to be an artist to earn my living. Okay, okay, okay. And how long were you in GBC for? I joined GBC in 61. I left GBC in 65 to go and work for the Volta River Authority at Akosombo during the construction period. Mm -hmm. I was in charge of the community center. It's my neck of the woods. <laughs> <laughs> I was there for a year. Mm -hmm. uh, but before I went, I was in broadcasting. My, my closest buddy was David Labby. He and I were like inseparable twins. Mm -hmm. And he had then gotten a job to go and work for the Ghana film industry. And I was there alone. So I asked my boss, 
to do something about my salary because David was earning more and they were not prepared to change the salary scale. Mm -hmm. Then I got this offer from VRA to be in charge of the community center. So I accepted it and I left, went to VRA at Custom. Mm -hmm. For a year? For a year. Whilst I was there, I was still doing TV series. Not my, the Mike Egan show. Yeah. I was doing a program called In Town. Uh, that's when I had the good fortune of interviewing Mary Makeba when she came to Ghana as Nkrumah's special guest. Okay. And I, yeah. did a, I did a program with her and then I interviewed her. So I went to Kosombo for a year and whilst I was there, as I said, I was doing these shows, earning my money and I saved some money and I decided that I should travel outside Ghana to broaden my horizon and improve myself as a broadcaster if that's what I wanted to do. And I'm going to take a break and when I come back, outside of Ghana linked Mike Egan to BBC. How did it all happen? Stay tuned. Hello and welcome back. And as I told you, Titi will be true and uh, you need to uh, appreciate your elders because they are a wealth of information. Now we are all the way in London and I know once we are in London, there should be BBC. But then apart from that, my camera zooms into this. This picture, if you go to the uh, Australian High Commission in Australia or somewhere like that, and I'm sure Uncle will tell me, this picture is out there and I'll tell you all about it. And now we're in London. Uh, what, what was the motive in going to London originally? Well, uh, uh, we had been in Ghana, myself, David Labi, and a few others, been broadcasting, and we were making people happy. But I, I, I never stopped listening to BBC and Voice of America, mm -hmm. to the presentation and the style of presentation. And I forget that, yes, we're doing well in Ghana. Uh, people seem to appreciate what we do, but one can improve one's quality in, in presenting program. So I decided to go to London on my own. But even before that, GBC had a training school where they were training Ghanaian broadcasters. Mm -hmm. uh, it was being handled by BBC. And some, every now and again, some Ghanaian broadcaster will be sent to BBC on attachment for training. But we were not being given that opportunity. And I wanted to improve myself because I've, chose, I've decided to make broadcast in my career. Mm -hmm. So I saved some money and took a plane and went to London. Uh, I knew that my friend and tutor, Peter Myers, was already there. And he was already on, on radio broadcasting to Good Morning Africa. So I thought once he's there and I got there, he will help me to get some links. So I took the plane, went to London and met Peter Myers. My first day he took me to BBC. Those days he didn't have to get a visa, did you? No, he didn't need a visa. And it cost me 300 pounds return ticket to go to London and back. Wow. So <laughs> I, I paid my own passage, 300. Ghana CDs, those days. Okay. That's, that's maybe 30 CDs now? No. And anyway, whatever 30, it is. 30 now. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I went to London, went, went to BBC, found Peter Myers. He welcomed me nicely and said he could help me. So he arranged, he took me there the next day, introduced me to some of the producers, and that's about all he did for me. And I was so disappointed because he didn't give me any leeway mm -hmm. To, to get established. I thought he would put me on his own program, knowing who I am and what I could do. But, so I kept going, never gave up. I kept going to the BBC offices every morning and sat down in one of the offices that was open for about three, four months wow. without any job. And then one day, the head of the African department saw me and came and said, young man, I've seen you here for a few months now. What are you doing here? So I told him who I am, my background, and he said, okay, we'll see what we can do. Then he introduced me to the BBC training school. We were a lot of Africans all looking for opportunity to do broadcasting. So I went to the training school for three months and went through the rudiments. An interesting experience I had there was that one day, the, the head of the department, the training school, Mr. Peter Fettis, was supposed to audit, no, what, audition, all the, well, I think there were about nine or ten people there, mm -hmm. girls and boys. So I, and we were given a script to go into the studio and read a script, and it's recorded. So I went in there, I was given the script, and I put on some accent. I was trying to be more British than a British guy. And then after five, less than five minutes, the man stopped me and said, come out, young man. So I came out and said, look, I've been in broadcasting 35 years. You can't impress me. 
what you did there was not you. Go in there and be yourself. Go on. So I went in there and I changed my style and did what I thought was me. And the two tapes were recorded and played back and one can tell the difference between the false presentation and the genuine presentation. Wow. The man took a great liking to me and was giving me extra classes and extra lessons. After the session, he asked me either to stay or give me another appointment to come back. And before the six months ended, he recommended me to the, one of the producers to use me as a presenter. And I met one Mr. Tony Cox, who asked me my background. I told him I was a disc jockey in Radio Ghana, blah, 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 blah. And he asked me whether I could do a series playing African music. I said, well, that's my 40. So he gave me 50 minutes twice a week to present music with the African beat. Wow. And this ran for four years. On BBC? On BBC. The, the most interesting part for me was that, but when I was leaving Britain to come back to Ghana, I recorded a series, and I had the last tape one month later, whilst I was still in Ghana. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my story with BBC. Back to Ghana. Now let me skip forward. Uh, how did the Mike Egan show start? Well, I, well, BBC, whilst I was there, apart from doing music with the African beat, I did a series of interviews with different personalities, mm. politicians, entertainers, uh, sportsmen, and all mm. that. Uh, I interviewed Johnny Mathis, an African-American singer. I interviewed Joe Louis. I had the good fortune of interviewing Muhammad Ali. I interviewed Ghanaians. I interviewed one South African pianist, very eccentric pianist, uh, but a good pianist. He was the one, when I was interviewing him, he said to me that people think they are watching television, but television is watching them. <laughs> you sit down and you watch television and you fall asleep and television you is watching, watching you. you. So I interviewed a lot of people uh, whilst I was there with the BBC. One interesting experience I had was that I was given the chance to go and interview Johnny Mathis, as I said earlier mm -hmm. on. And at that time, because he was so fair in color, I thought he was a white guy. So I went to London Palladium to interview him. And uh, I was late in the appointment. So when I got out of the, the tube station, I hailed a taxi and said, take me to London Palladium. Meanwhile, I've opened the door and I sat in. The man looked at me and said, are you new here? I said, yes. He said, that's it. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> well, out of Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I was there already, but I, wanted, I didn't want to be late. So that was it. But then Johnny Mattis, I went to see him. He agreed to do the interview because BBC had booked it late already. Mm -hmm. But he wanted me to see his first show. So after the first show, then I went to see him face to face. And I realized that he was as black as I was. But they do a lot of, uh, what you call it? Makeup. Makeup. Eyebrows, lipstick, and all that. Then after the show, he asked me where I've come from, from Ghana. Ghana was then the most popular African country in the world. And he was excited. So he asked me, that also gave me my first opportunity to drive in a Rolls Royce. Yeah. He was going out for fun and his, his car was a Rolls Royce. So he said, join me on a trip to any of the nightclubs. So I joined him, we went to Tiffany, we went to three different nightclubs. Then he dispatched me and I went home. That's nice. Yeah. That was the idea that birthed the uh, Mike Egan show when you came no, back. No. So when I came back, because of the experience I've had in doing several interviews, yeah. I decided that I should try it on television. So I went to the head of programs in television and suggested this idea to him. He said, put it on paper and bring it to me. So I went and put the ideas on paper. I think everybody has some interesting story to tell. So if you bring it even a taxi driver, you could pick on something that you and I don't normally recognize mm -hmm. as important. So I gave the paper to him. Two weeks later, he didn't show any interest. And then about four or five months later, he called me and said, look, the idea that you brought, uh, there's a program on TV called In Town. People are getting a bit disenchanted with it. So I would like you to bring your program back and let's see if it can work out. So I went and did a pilot. I had Roy Ankara on, the first African featherweight champion of the mm -hmm. world, Ghanaian. I had my own brother who was then sports commentator, ceremonial commentator and a musician, he plays drums and sings. <laughs> then I had uh, another person, I think there were four people, a variety of people. So I did an interview with the pilot. It was taken to 
to the head of programs to listen to it. And someone told me they were watching that program, that they were auditing that program that day. So I sneaked in and sat at the back. At the end of the program, they all said, that's a good program, but Mike is too troublesome. Can we handle him? <laughs> then I coughed. <coughs> Then they turned and saw that I was the one sitting down there. So they passed the program, and that was the birth of the Mikey Gunn Show. Wow. Have you still got that red sports car? <laughs> well, it's pretty old now. You're talking about 1975, 76. And um, I couldn't keep that car for long. I bought it second hand, hmm. in any case. It was a red uh, Master R RX-7. I don't even know what car it was. I don't know that the, the lights... Yeah, a lot of kids got fascinated with it. When, it, when you switch on the lights right. and it opens and closes again. I'm saying hi to you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the car became an icon. Yeah, a lot of people ask me, where is that car? Yeah. And I don't know where it is myself. Whoever it is that's got it, you know, you could auction that car. You, know, you, could, make, you could make lots of money on it. That car became an icon. Your pro political career, I mean, any time, I think, I think you're more associated with uh, media than politics, even though you're very, very strong in politics. Uh, I didn't know until much, much later that you were involved in politics. Any time I think of Mike Keegan, it's like you think of a, you know, Kenwood and you think of a blender. <laughs> <laughs> you know, think of, uh, you know, vacuum cleaner and you think Hoover. You know, so I think of exquisite media presentation at Mike Keegan but you have a strong politician. Uh, I don't think I'm a strong politician. I'm still a student of politics. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning the ropes of politics. But even before I got into politics, I got into business too. Oh. After several years in broadcasting, I got a bit disillusioned because there was too much official dumb. Mm. Things you cannot do, things you cannot say. Mm. It may interest you to know that I introduced phonies in Ghana oh. in 1973. Was when, he ahead of to go over? It or? was. When I first brought it up, the technical boss said, it's not possible, we can't do it here. But it's been done on the BBC World Service. Mm -hmm. So I discussed with one of the technicians, and he said, it could be done. So the two of us worked it out, and then we did it. And I did, I did a series of broadcasts with uh, Dr. Joyce Ai. She was my co-presenter mm -hmm. in the program. And what I did was that every week I'll choose a topic, uh, maybe uh, family life. And then people will phone in and give us their ideas about family life and we'll interact with them. And then one day I said I wanted to discuss uh, press freedom. And my boss said, you wouldn't dare do that. This was a champion regime. How dare you go and this is a delicate subject and you put all of us in trouble. Meanwhile, the program had gone on for about eight, nine months, mm -hmm. and it's gaining a lot of popularity. Even that champion was listening to it. Wow. So when I refused to do then I said that if you're not going to allow me to do it, I've done this program for about a year, there hasn't been any difficulty. Okay. So if you won't allow me to do it, then this is the end of the program. I said, they put in somebody else to do it, and it wasn't the same. No. Because, of course, it wasn't his idea, mm -hmm. and the, the style and the passion wasn't the same. So the program was taken off the air. Then I hear a champion call to find out what has happened to that program. So they asked me to do it again. And of course I said, I won't do it. Once it's off, it's off the air. Oh, so you never got to discuss the uh, press? Freedom. No, I, I didn't. I, no, I said, I had given up the program. So that was, that was the end of it. Wow. So then you went into business. So I went into business. I, the frustration, the official term was too much. So I decided that I would go into business. Here again, another interesting story of my life. I was trying to make ends meet and take care of my family. Yeah. I was doing a lot of nightclub business as a disc jockey in one of the posh nightclubs in town called, uh, uh, what's the name of the name? Chevalet, Chevalet. Before my time. Yeah, before your time. <laughs> so I was a disc jockey there and I personalized the whole atmosphere there. That once you walked in, I knew you and I knew your name and I'll call your name and ask you how is your wife or something like that. So a lot of people wanted to be part of that scene. Like a family. Yes. So one day one of my friends came to me and said, look, Mike, people come here because of you. So why don't you start your own discotheque? And I said, but I don't have money. He said, okay. He laughed and went away. 
About a week later, he came back and left an envelope on my disc jockey desk. But the thing is that when people come and I entertain them and they're happy, they will ask me, what would you like to drink? And I usually say, brandy and coke, and I, I don't drink. I don't like alcohol because I sleep when I drink alcohol. But I have arranged with a bar attendant that if anybody comes for brandy coke for me, give me the coke, keep the cash for the brandy. Money for my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> so when they are leaving, they go and pay the bill, and then she'll give me the cash, and I drink the coke. <laughs> so this man left the money, came and left an envelope on my desk. Mm -hmm. I, did, I didn't open it till I, I closed, about 2 o'clock in the morning. Got home, opened it, and I saw that 300 Ghana CDs. What is this for? So I called him, Mr. Ralph Christ. He's still alive. And I asked him what he said, but I, said, I asked you to do your own disco. And you say you didn't have money, so there's money for you. Trend kind of cities. My goodness. What am I going to do with it? So I kept it in the jacket of my coat for maybe five, six months, not knowing what to do. Incidentally, the man that I was working for, a Swiss guy, came back from holidays and said that he didn't need my services anymore. So I was compelled to find my own means of living. So I went back to the 300 Ghana seeds the guy gave me and decided that I needed a place of my own. Luckily, a lady friend that I knew found a place for me. So I started Mike's Disco. Mike's Disco. Mike's Disco. <coughs> now, when I, was, when I got the disco going, before I started the disco, I didn't have enough money. So my tables, I went and bought one long timber at the timber market and cut into pieces. And they were my tables. And then for my ice tray, I used bamboo tree, the joints, were cut mm -hmm. and put sand in it as my ice tray and left it on the table. table. That's ice tray. And the walls were all bamboo, Africanization. <laughs> I didn't have money. <laughs> <laughs> Innovation got <laughs> away. Yes, yes. So I, I did that and started my disco. Then I asked my friends to help me find a name for the disco. And at the top of it, they say, possible names for my disco. And they wrote several 30, 40 names. And we couldn't choose anyone else. Someone said, why don't you use the top one, my disco? The, the, the names the, the are... <laughs> so we went back, my Disco, and our, our motto was Super Sounds and Snacks. Wow. So that was the birth of my Disco. Wow. <laughs> so now you know. Now when we come back, guess what? The Order of the Volta. We're going to discuss all the awards and achievements. Stay tuned. Well, folks, as I said, Titi will be true. Never forget that. You always need to go back and learn something. The first ever man in the media to get a grand award. Now, for those of you who've never won an award, as you can see, there's a big one, there's a small one, and there's a little clip here. Now, there's instructions that come with the manual, right? Now, ordinary size medal worn daytime. Uh, miniature size medal evening uh, and nighttime, and then the ribbon to be worn when in service uniform or uniform of a voluntary organization, either singularly, singularly or extended ribbon bar. There you go. So next time when you win an award, remember how to wear it. Uncle, <laughs> well, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. 1979. Yes. Did it come as a surprise? It was a big surprise to me. Uh, I had started my first hotel sundown hotel at the airport residential area mm -hmm. and i was down with malaria so i didn't go to work for a couple of days and i went to the office in the evening to see what's going on just a casual visit then my late brother walked in and said congratulations and we tease each other every now and again so i thought he was teasing me for being ill <laughs> they said no 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 something more interesting i just heard on the radio that you've been given a grand medal for your meritorious service in the media I said, are you sure? Are you sure it's not somebody else? I said, no, I heard it. And that's why I've come to congratulate you. So that was my first big surprise that, in fact, the Ghanaian populace have appreciated my little contribution in the media. Wow. Moving on swiftly. Now, this is the first time ever I'm holding the order of the Volta. I am actually more privileged than he who received it. <laughs> <laughs> he who received it. And, Uncle, tell us about this one. Well, this one... Also, as you were saying earlier on that, I got involved in politics and social life. Mm. 
1992, just before the ban on political things were, were lifted. Uh, I got invited by Mr. Tommy Thompson mm -hmm. of Free Press, together with my good friend and brother, Mr. Rudolf von Bolmus, that uh, they were trying to revive the Nkrumah's tradition. Mm -hmm. And they knew that we had some Nkrumah's inclination, so whether we would be interested in joining. So we went to the meeting and we got interested. At that time, Kuku Bakun was there mm -hmm. and he was an inspiration to me. Mr. Freddie Blay was there. Sir Thomas Thompson himself, Alaji Nifuta was also there, and Kwesi uh, Able, uh, Seth Abloso, and a few others. So that's how I got interested in politics. Uh, so m for my contribution in politics, I think uh, President Kufo got impressed. Mm -hmm. And in his last stage of leaving the, the, the throne, he also gave awards to people and I was one of the recipients of the Order of the Volta. Doesn't matter where you find yourself, you just have to do your best, isn't it? Indeed, indeed. One of the things- All your stories, it's like you just did your best at one point and something happened. I, I believe in hard work, I believe in dedication, I believe in perseverance. And I believe that money shouldn't be the motivating factor if you want to achieve any result. Mm -hmm. and saying that reminds me of the first recording that I, the guitar club thing that yeah. I told you earlier on. Yeah. When it was recorded, all the musicians were given five guineas each. I wasn't given a penny. Wow. And they were teasing me. And the mic, I will remove one more, yeah. <laughs> this is called a remuneration. <laughs> okay. On, on the that uh -huh. I said, well, well, maybe, but one more would you be? They just laughed yeah. and didn't give me. But the interesting thing is that it led me to become what I am today. Yeah. If I hadn't done that, out of goodwill and good intentions, maybe I wouldn't be talking to you today. Wow. So money has never been a motivation for me. I believe in doing your very best to achieve results that you can, you can, people will recognize. And I think luckily, my literary contribution has been appreciated by the Ghanaian populace and heads of state. And 1979, it was not President Kufu. No. So. I see. Now, the picture on the screen, and you see Kofu standing in the midst of some, you know, CPP gurus. And Uncle, you're going to tell me about that picture. In 2000, the whole wind in Ghana was a change in government. Mm -hmm. uh, the PNDC, NDC, have been in power for so long that everybody wanted to change. So after the first round, Kofu was second to uh, then I think uh, President Atamels. Yeah. So. We decided to support President Kufo, but that was CPP. I was then a member of CPP. Now I'm People Progressive People's Party. I want, okay. to, I want to emphasize, I want to emphasize. I'm, I'm no more CPP. I see. I'm People's Progressive <laughs> see. People's Party. Party. So CPP then decided to support Kufo mm -hmm. in the second round. And so we had invited him to come to the CPP party office to discuss the modalities and what will be our expectations if we helped him to win. And we have given him 9 o'clock for the meeting. By 9.15, he hadn't shown up. By 9.30, he hadn't shown up. Those days, he was only a candidate. So I could even reach him on telephone. <laughs> so since I was the PR for CPP, I called him and he said, oh, he hasn't been told about any such meeting, but could he come at that time? It was then about 10 o'clock. So my chairman, who was then Professor uh, Abubakar Alassan, mm -hmm. said that you should come the following day, which was, I think, a Thursday, by 9 o'clock. I drove from Sunrise Hotel, which is about five minutes drive, to the place about five to nine, and President Kufo, candidate Kufo, then was already there <laughs> with his people. For me, the interesting thing is that because he needed our support, he was more than punctual. After that, <laughs> to see the president, you need to go through a series of protocol <laughs> and signatures before you could see him. So that's the story of that, and I think one of these days I'm going to take the opportunity to go to his house and ask him to autograph it for me because it's a historic <laughs> picture the day that he came for support from CPP. And then we see you uh, standing with uh, Erica Powell in the next picture. And I know that is another significant moment. Yes, Erica Powell was Dr. Nkrumah's secretary when he was prime minister and then president of Ghana. And uh, we heard that she was not feeling too well and mm -hmm. she needed some help. So some of the CPP people uh, approached President Kufo 
these 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 ladies uh, have helped Ghana in the early stages. Could you extend a little gesture of appreciation to them? And President Gufoy said yes, he would, if only the party would make a formal request. Mm -hmm. So we did made a formal request, and that's the picture that you see me sitting next to President Gufoy at the castle. He was under the castle then. And and then. In the next picture is uh, June yes. Mill. No, let, let me finish with the Rebecca Powell thing. Okay. Yeah. So we went and President Gufu agreed to assist us. So mm -hmm. he gave a donation to both Erica Powell and June Mill, who is the one in charge of Nkrumah's literature, literal sure. works. So we went to see Erica Powell, myself, my, my good friend Adai Sibo, and the then acting high commissioner in, in London, Mr. Arthur. Mm -hmm. We went to see this lady, gave her the check, and she, she shed tears because she said she hasn't seen that amount of money for God knows how long. Wow. She shed tears. But for me, the interesting thing is that there was a particular picture for Sajifu in, in, his, yeah. in her house mm -hmm. that I haven't mm -hmm. seen. I've seen many of his pictures, different postures. This one I haven't seen, so I asked her, where is this picture from? And she said that... Uh, and that's the one on the screen now with Sajifu sort of gazing yes. out of the clouds. Yes. Uh, Madam Erica was saying that when she heard Nkrumah had died in Bucharest, she sat down, she's an artist herself, okay. and pictured him as she remembered him wow. and did that artwork. And I thought that was so unique that I used my little crumb and captured it. And when I came back to Ghana, I enlarged it. And I'm very proud to say that for me, there are only four copies in the world. Wow. The original one, I have one, and I've given two to, to two of my very good friends. And it's different. I haven't seen it anywhere other than you, the one you You showed. have to come to my house to see it. <laughs> <laughs> other than the one you are seeing, that's, that's wonderful. And you, your picture taken by Bano, is it Bano, the, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the, uh, the photographer, photo yeah. of you standing at Piccadilly. Mm. Uh, it's, it's become a very popular picture. Indeed, indeed. In 1966 or 67, I think 67, the drum magazine, I don't know if you've ever heard about the drum no. magazine. Oh, okay, one of the popular magazines then did a feature on me with several pictures and my story, uh, having been with the BBC, running my own series and all that. And so Mr. Barnard took those pictures, one at the BBC studio, and then one, several other pictures around Piccadilly Circus in London, even though there was some. But Mr. Barnard held an exhibition in the book in London, a photo exhibition, and it was photos taken by non-British people that have made of landmarks in Britain. Okay. That was the exhibition. And when the exhibition ended, they did a, a compilation of all that in the book. And somehow, my picture was chosen as a cover picture of the book. And it makes me humble, it makes me proud as well. I see you added color to Piccadilly. <laughs> <laughs> I see you added color to Piccadilly. There's so much action, you know, life in that picture. Mm, yeah. And uh, I see you. Uh, but let's come back to uh, uh, a bit of politics. No, but before I do politics, I want us to do standards. Because I pick from you your diction, your compulsion. And uh, now I know why, you know, the likes of my uncle, KSM, and all these thespian aspire to be like you. Is it from your training? And after that, what do you think about the standards today? Well, again, my father's humble beginnings did help. Because of his position as a civil servant, he was given a bungalow close to the, uh, what shall I say, an inn or a lodge where the, the, the expatriates, each time they came, those days it was not easy flying all the way from London to Ghana, so they, they came by boat. And when they come, they are put in their guest house for a couple of days, and then they are transported to, to uh, Accra or wherever their stations will be. And so we had the opportunity of growing up with white kids. Mm -hmm. So that influenced our diction and our way of speaking okay. to a certain point. And it's interesting, when I went to BBC and I was struggling to be recognized, when I finally got the chance, the head of the African department, Mr. Bill Abraham, said that my accent was mid-Atlantic. Because it's not Ghanaian, it's not British, it's not American. But I've crossed the Atlantic to be there, so I had a mid-Atlantic accent. That's a good one. <laughs> so so that, that's how, I, I think that's how it happened. 
standards today? I mean, I'm sure you flip through the radio. Well, standards today, today is because it's good and it's bad. Mm -hmm. It's created competition. Mm. And I think competition is always healthy, depending on how it is conducted. Mm -hmm. But I think because of the competition and because of the wide range of radio stations that are coming, everybody feels that they are okay. They are not being given the proper tutelage. Mm -hmm. For example, in our early days, after a program, they would tell you you did not do proper enunciation. Your T's didn't stand out as T's. Your S's didn't stand out. I just said out. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, people would say out, mm -hmm. uh, expecting you to know that they wanted to say out. out. So we, you must learn these things. And somehow, I don't think we are carrying it on. The other problem is that there are a lot of people doing interviews and most of them don't do any research. <laughs> they just take a... I tell you an example. I won't name the station. I was invited to a radio station for an interview. I went in there, introduced myself, and the guy said, oh, but what is your position in the party? You invited me there to come and talk about my party and you don't know my position. So what are we going to talk about? So I said thank you and I walked out. <laughs> so I didn't do the interview. <laughs> but, so I'm just saying this to harp on that we need to do some bit of research mm -hmm. into whatever you want to discuss. Uh, as, as an interviewer, you don't have to be an authority on the subject, but you must know and understand the subject so they can ask meaningful questions. Mm -hmm. I think that's what's lacking mo most, most of the stations. Training is important, and also doing your research and learning on the job. Important. But how can I come here and not talk about tennis? <laughs> if I didn't do any research at all. <laughs> you I did least, some research. I did a <laughs> to know that I'm listening with a man who loves tennis. Do you find time to play? I'm a tennis freak. <laughs> I used to play table tennis. Very good. Okay. And uh, I was a captain for Second Itakura Table Tennis Club. Then one day we were supposed to go and play a tournament in Cape Coast. <laughs> So I was to lead my team from Western Region to Cape Coast to play the tournament. And Louis Sachmo Armstrong was coming to Ghana on a visit, Accra International Airport. So I jumped on the bus, led my team to Cape Coast, and I got off and came to Accra just so I can go to the airport and meet Louis Armstrong. And I cherished that moment. He came out of the plane. There were lots of Ghanaian bands there playing. He went back to the plane, brought his trumpet, and joined. Wow. He's never had high life before. They were playing all for you, TTO. Mm -hmm. He came in and played some sounds, and everybody went wild. So I went and touched his jacket, touching Louis Sachmo Armstrong. <laughs> then the policeman came and hit me with a truncheon, but I was happy. <laughs> <laughs> I've touched his jacket. I've satisfied myself. Wow. So that's my ten table tennis career, and I let them to, to play Cape Coast later. And I played for Ghana against Nigeria too in 19... Ah, you represented Ghana? Yeah, represented Ghana. I was beaten though. Ni Nigerians were excellent. They were better players than we were. But in 1958, Independence Anniversary, I partnered my friend, Mr. Jackson. He's died. May he rest in mm -hmm. peace. The two of us played against the Quay brothers. And we beat them to become the national doubles champion in Ghana. Wow. So I carried my table tennis ideas into tennis. And the tennis started when I started my second hotel, Sunrise Hotel, with my partner, Sandy Anderson. We had a tennis court, we had a coach, but those were the hard days, 1982, 83. Yeah. People were not interested in tennis. <laughs> and even the experts who came didn't think of coming with their tennis rackets and things. So one day I went to the coach and said, why don't you teach me to play tennis? So I took to tennis. Now I'm a tennis freak. <laughs> and until the last 10 years, I was going to France every year to play in the veterans tournament. Really? Once, the, my first time there, I think I got to the third round. My second time, I went to quarterfinals. My last time that I was there, I think I went to the finals, and I lost. But the veterans, now at my tender age, I still play tennis, and I beat some of the young boys at my club. <laughs> you should have brought your cameras there to see me play. They think I'm old, you know, and I, I'm proud to say that I'm 78 years old, but God has been kind to me. I've got, I've got a lot of life, got a vitality, I've got energy, and I, simply, I play three times in a week. And the looks, you kept the looks. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, <laughs> until I come to you with another personality, it's so sad 
I have to end this now. My time is just literally gone. I need three days with this man. I told you, Titi will be true. Never let your old folks free. Tap them for all they have, and you will find some education. What I learned is that at every given time, just perform your best. You never know. Sometime in the future, you'll reap the results. Thank you very much for watching, and have a brilliant weekend.